Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Nice to meet you again students Welcome back to Poetry Class Our title today The Value of a Dictionary We have a quotation here Use the dictionary It's better than the critics And it's a death resort to her students So this is an important quotation. Use the dictionary, it's better than the critics. You know that the critics are people who are expert in criticizing. But according to Elizabeth Bishop, dictionary is better than critics. If a poem If a poet travels to seek out the best words available, the least we can do is to find out what the words mean. The dictionary is a firm ally in reading poems. If the poems are more than a sensory good, it is indispensable. So, according to this explanation, dictionary is indispensable. It's very important when we find, for example, poem with old words yeah, that sometimes we cannot find in everyday life. Meanings change. So the meaning in the past sometimes are very different with the meanings. Nowadays, the meanings change. When the Elizabethan poet George Carcoin wrote, O oh, Abraham spreads, O oh, fruit of blessed seed, the word spreads implied neither irritation nor contempt. So the meaning changes. Spreads at a time means irritation nor contempt. When in the 17th century Andrew Marvel imagined two lovers, vegetable love, he referred to a vegetative or growing love, not one resembling lettuce. Yes, at that time we have the term vegetable love, but now It is not available anymore. It is in old language. And when Queen Anne, in a famous anecdote, called the just completed St. Paul's Cathedral, awful, artificial, and amusing, its architect, Sir Christopher Wren, was overwhelmed with joy and gratitude. For what she had told him, was that it was awe-inspiring, artful, and stimulating to contemplate or to amuse. So, please remember that sometimes positive meaning in the past today becomes negative. Something happy in the past, it can be something sad today. So, remember the time and you can check it correctly when you say or when you see in a dictionary. In reading poetry, there is nothing to be done about the inevitable tendency of language to change except to watch out for it. So please be careful with The meanings. The meanings of a word, it depends on the time. Meanings change, remember. If you suspect that a word has shifted in meaning over the years, most standard test dictionaries will be helpful. An unabridged dictionary, more helpful still, and most helpful of all, the Oxford English Dictionary, which gives for each definition 
successive examples of the words written used through the past thousand years. So I hope all of you at this dictionary, Oxford English Dictionary, because this is standard book for students, especially English students, eh? English study program students. Oxford English Dictionary is a complete dictionary which gives definition successive examples of the words written used through the past thousand years. So the meaning in the past and the meaning of today is available in Oxford English Dictionary. You need not feel a grim obligation to keep interrupting a poem in order to ramage in the dictionary. To ramage means to, to look for, yeah? to open, to open the meaning in the dictionary. But if the poem is worth reading very closely, you may wish any aid you can find. So sometimes a poem consists of many valuable words and you cannot miss one of them. So you have to know all of them. You have to know the meanings of each word in the poem. It's very important for you. One of the valuable services of poetry is to recall for us the concrete physical sense that certain words once had. But since I've lost, as the English critic, it comes as remarked in literature and criticism. Remember again? Yeah? To recall for us the concrete physical sense. Several weeks ago, we talked about this. Eh? Concrete and physical sense is more beneficial for a poet to portray their feelings. Because concrete and physical sense can lead us as readers to imagine concretely. We use a word like powerful without feeling that it is really powerful. We don't seem today to taste the full flavor of words as we feel that Falstaff and Shakespeare and probably his audience tasted them when he was uploading the features of good Sarisek, which makes the brain apprehensive, quick, provocative, full of nimble, theory, and delectable shapes, and being less aware of the life and substantially of words, we are probably less aware of things that these words stand for. So remember, the meanings change. Yeah? Sometimes not only the time, but also the combination, the combination of words. If one word is combined with Another word, probably it will have different meaning if the word combined with another word. So be careful with this one. Every word which is used to express a moral or intellectual fact, said Emerson in his study nature, if the trace to its root is bound to be borrowed from some material appearance. Right means straight, wrong means twisted, spirit primarily means win, transgression, the crossing of a line, supercilious, the raising of a eyebrow. Bruce in a dictionary and you will discover such original concreteness. Here, the explanation told us how uh, something concrete or something physical usually give some meanings. Remember this statement. If 
the thrust to its root it's found to be borrowed from some material appearance yeah? to thrust you know to thrust to seek out to seek out the root the origin it can be some material appearance this is an example right means straight you mean right right is the opposite of wrong okay? and then straight straight is something like this one okay? this is straight straight not pen okay? not pen but straight and straight means right wrong means twisted wrong means twisted like this okay? and then spirit primarily means wind you know spirit Yes, spirit. If you do not understand, if you do not understand spirit, you can check in your dictionary. Spirit primary means wind. Yeah? Wind. I think it's very familiar with you. Transgression, the crossing of line. Supercell is the raising of an eyebrow. An eyebrow. Yeah? The raising of an eyebrow. This was this one eyebrow. If it is raised, then it means that supercilious or boastful. We are boastful. Yeah? Raising of an eyebrow. An eyebrow, and this one is eyelash. So you have to know the difference between eyebrow and eyelash. Rose in a dictionary, and you will discover such original concreteness. So sometimes, and many times, not only sometimes, yeah, but many times, words come from something original, uh, something concrete. These are revealed in your dictionary's etymologies or brief notes on the derivation of words given in most dictionaries near the beginning of an entry on a word. So etymology. Eh? You have to know the meaning of etymology or derivation of words, the origin of words. Usually in dictionary, you can find near the beginning of an entry on a word. Usually in dictionary, you find many entries in the words, and then you can find it, the origin of the word. In some dictionaries, at the end of the entry, look up squirrel, for instance, for instance, and you will find it comes from two Greek words meaning shadow tail. Squirrel, you know, squirrel is a, an animal that usually we can find in uh, very high trees, and then usually they jump from one tree to another tree with the tail. Okay? The tail go up. So it must be like this, shadow tail. Okay? Because the tail goes up. For another example of a common word that originally contains a poetic metaphor, look up the origin of daisy. Okay? Daisy is the name of flower. You can check in the summary. An allusion is an indirect reference to any person, place, or thing fictitious, historical, or actual. Sometimes, to understand an allusion in a poem, we have to find out something we didn't know before. Yeah? This is the meaning of allusion in direct reference to any person, place, or thing fictitious, historical, or actual. So this is allusion. To understand allusion, according to this explanation, we have to find out something we didn't know before. So it is a kind of comparison. Eh? to compare 
something to something else. But usually the void asks of us only common knowledge. So usually a void to induce something that is not very popular. Usually the poet give us common knowledge. Everyone knows. Yeah? Everyone knows the allusion. When in his poem to Helen, Edgar Allan Poe refers to the glory that was Greece and the grandeur that was Rome, he assumes that we have heard of these places. So when Edgar Allan Poe say Greece and Rome, these two places, these two names are very famous, not only in the past, but until now. Greece and Rome are very famous country yeah? until now. Although it's different, Rome in the past and Rome nowadays, it's different. But all of us know that Greece and Rome are names of countries. He also expects that we will understand his allusion to cultural achievements of those ancient nations and perhaps even catch the subtle contrast between those two similar words, glory and grandeur, with its suggestion that for all of its merits, Roman civilization was also more pompous than Greek. Yes, you know that those two countries, those two nations, ancient nations here, yeah, have cultural achievements. Most of exports are from Greek and Rome. So they have a similar uh, predicates like glory and grandeur. These terms are similar, but here in this explanation, it is a kind of subtle contrast between those two similar words, glory and grandeur, with its suggestion that for all its merits, yeah, its merits, its uh, appropriateness, its achievement, Roman civilization was also more pompous than Greek. Yeah? More um, proudful, yeah? more pompous, more more everything. Yeah? Roman is better than Greek, although it's only a little bit better, a little bit different. Yeah? Because the writer or the poet use similar words, glory and grandeur. Allusions not only enrich the meaning of a poem, they also save space. So remember this one, allusions not only enrich the meaning of a poem, they also save space. You have to be able to explain it. Why ex it explain that they also save space because they don't need to explain many things in many words. Yeah? They just say something and the people will imagine. Uh, they will imagine the place with their own imagination. In the love song of J. Alfred Pafrock, T. S. Eliot, T. S. Eliot is a very famous poet. By giving a brief introductory quotation from the speech of a damned soul in Dante's Inferno, is able to suggest that his poem will be the confession of a soul in torment, who sees no chance of escape. So, he says something, 
then he can say, he can tell us about confession of a soul in torment. Soul in torment is a kind of depression. Yeah? Depression. Something terrible in his soul. Often in reading a poem, you will meet a name you don't recognize, on which the meaning of a line or perhaps a whole poem seems to depend. In this light, most such unfamiliar references and allusions are glossed or footnoted. But when you venture out on your own in reading poems, you may find yourself needlessly perplexed unless you look up any other words. So, sometimes allusion is not something popular for you. So you have to know this. You have to read more references to understand the allusion. I don't know exactly why the poet, sometimes you know, some poets use something not common. But maybe you want to arouse your spirit to read more or to find in different references. So you will be rich with knowledge. Unless the name is one that the poet made up, you will probably find it in one of the larger desk dictionaries, such as Webster's Collective Dictionary or the American Heritage Dictionary. If you don't solve your problems there, try an encyclopedia, a world atlas, the Hutton Mayfair Dictionary of Biography or Brewer's Dictionary of Face and Fable. So beside Oxford English Dictionary, you can also find more complete dictionary like Webster's College Dictionary. It's the thickest dictionary in the world. Yeah? Webster's College Dictionary. But if you don't find the words in this dictionary, you can also find in Encyclopedia. Encyclopedia usually give more examples about the use of words. Some allusions are quotations from other poems. In R.S. Quinn's 1880, the narrator describes an insomnia watching with night infomercials. You know, insomnia? Insomnia is someone who cannot sleep at night. Yeah. Credit cards out, pencil and notepad handy. The insomniac sings deeply in his chair. So, you know, credit cards, yeah? we don't have credit cards, we don't have money, we don't have pencil, we don't have notepad, etc. Then, the insomniac, the person who cannot sleep well in the night, then uh, sings deeply in his chair. Just sit, sit in his chair. Packing with neatness in his glass of brandy, tonic once more the refilled sleep of care. So, glass of brandy, he drinks liquor. He drinks more liquor, tonic once more in the refilled sleep of care. He wants to refill his insomnia. You want to be able to sleep at that night. As with control, etc., summon spread visions from the midnight air. He wants to call for help from midnight air. Yeah? So midnight air usually is very cold and then the person who cannot Sleep well, the insomnia. He wants to know from the in the midnight and why he cannot sleep well. 
In addition to some witty wordplay, like the pun on remote control, Queen borrows a famous line from Six Year Macbeth, Shriek that makes up the record sleeve of care. So, he borrow from uh, Six Year, yeah? Six Year Macbeth. Macbeth is a title of play by Shakespeare. Queen Horus, yeah? Horus, a famous line. The famous line is sleep that makes up the level sleep of care. To describe this unsmoothing protagonist, to refer means the same as to unravel, to loosen or disentangle. Why quote Shakespeare in a poem about watching TV commercials? Partly, it is just one poet's delight in replaying another poet's verbal home runs. But well chosen allusions also pack an extra wallop of meaning into a poem. So, this is an example of allusion by borrowing some lines from another poet. According to this explanation, it saves many space because the poet doesn't need to explain it more because the readers already know that the meaning of, for example, sleep that needs up the level sleep of care can come from six years Macbeth meaning. So, this is important yeah? to replay another poet's football home runs. Yeah? It means that some poets have specific expression, and the specific expression usually means very specific. And another poet, Gurus, this specific meanings. The line that Gwyn Boros comes from Macbeth's description of a mysterious voice he claims to have heard after murdering Duncan. The voice prophesied that Macbeth shall sleep no more. Alluding to Shakespeare's line, therefore, Gwyn can summon up all sorts of dark nocturnal association that he then turns. Yeah? So this is an example of uh, illusion that Puru that Puru some lines from another poet in his time Queen Puru's from Shakespeare's line from the play Macbeth. Okay, I think it's enough and I hope you can enjoy this day and see you next time. Assalamu alaikum.